Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Well, if you've had a chance to review these a little bit and study them in the lab and look at various teeth, let's spend a little bit of time here identifying some of these variations that you've been seeing in the lab. Probably the most common one that you see in the lab is calculus, which is frequently a hard deposit that actually sticks right to the surface of the tooth. And with just a little bit of prying, sometimes this pops off. This is something that uh, is a contributing factor to our periodontal disease and something that you'll spend much time uh, attempting to identify and remove. This comes in uh, various quantities. Sometimes we'll find large quantities of it, particularly in the lower incisor teeth and sometimes it'll be way down on the root. Sometimes it'll be in areas that would be up on the crown or super gingival, above the gingiva. Other times it'll be rather deep in the root structure of the tooth. Some of these areas we can see little lines on the root structure. This is where the tissue attached to the tooth and upon removal it has dried. And uh, this is not necessarily calculus, but it's just plain dried tissue that we get involved in uh, on these tooth structures. But you should be able to identify the difference between some calculus and uh, dried tissue. Sometimes we can get into extreme excesses with this calculus. This is just a real gross excess amount of calculus that's accumulated on this lower incisor. Needless to say, uh, the tooth was lost. It's uh, amazing to understand how it uh, stayed long enough to collect that much. Another colored material you'll find on many of these teeth is just the tars from tobacco. These may not be present in a quantity visible enough to be raised above the tooth surface or like the calculus, but you just may have a thin film of tars that would accumulate on some of these teeth. Oftentimes the calculus and the tars are so combined that it's hard to separate them. But sometimes it'll be just plain one or plain the other, uh, either plain stain or plain uh, calculus. <clears throat> Another discoloration which you'll find on these teeth is uh, the contact points. Oftentimes these will be brownish in color and will have a tendency to stain. This is a, a central here and on the mesial it's rather close to the incisal edge. On the distal we can see the contact point and it's not as close to the incisal edge but it's just a little browned stained area there. Sometimes these are real present, sometimes uh, they're not real visible uh, for just plain shiny spots on the tooth. And here we can see the mesial contact point. This is a lateral now, it's not as close to the incisal ledge. If we look over to the distal of the lateral, actually it's out more towards the distal lingual here, you can see that it starts to get down into the more of the mid portion of the tooth than this one. Again, this is some of the dried up gingival attachment down here. Sometimes these contact points can be confused with early caries. Uh, caries on these teeth frequently occurs just below the contact point and will often start as a darkened area but it actually will begin to soften the uh, tooth structure and will start to cavitate a little bit. We'd like to have you explore these teeth with your uh, explorers and actually feel this calculus and feel the uh, areas of contact or if they start to cavitate a little bit into the areas where uh, this caries is actually beginning to occur. This is probably our most common area where we'll find caries. Now in the actual mouth this carious area will, I should say decayed area also, caries is our dental term for decay and probably more commonly used in the dental school and in the literature and what have you, uh, the lay terminology that patients are familiar with, just plain decay. This is frequently very soft and kind of a cheesy uh, consistency in the mouth. Since these teeth have been extracted and many of them dried rather hard, it, it still will be softer than the tooth structure, but it'll be more of a firm leather rather than a, a cheese type uh, consistency. Sometimes these uh, curious areas will occur in the cementum. The cementum is uh, much softer than the uh, 
uh, enamel, and if we get a gingival recession, occasionally this will be down at the cemento enamel junction, the CE area, and they can get rather large in size, and uh, of course you see them all the way from this right up to the tooth completely gone. One of the, <coughs> in trying to identify the restorations that evolve from this type of uh, carious lesion, uh, the most common one is those interproximally, where we're involved with a white filling material. Uh, many of these were a synthetic porcelain, and today many of them are a plastic uh, glass combination of materials, and you'll get involved in the actual chemical and physical makeup of these materials in rather extensive detail, but this is basically what we're seeing. Probably many of you have these in your mouth. Uh, the lingual pits on these anteriors are oftentimes filled with a uh, amalgam or a silver filling, silver being the lay term and the technical term being amalgam on it. Uh, this is actually a central incisor here that had a deep lingual pit that actually grooved right down onto the cingulum. We find uh, lateral incisors will very frequently have this pit filled. We remember indicated that our uh, lateral incisors had the uh, deepest pit on the lingual, and this more frequently becomes carious and oftentimes will require just a small restoration. I noticed in the light we picked up a flat, shiny reflection on this tooth. And if we get it just right, it's very reflective. This is a wear facet. It is an area of the tooth that is contacting with the lower incisor when the teeth are biting together or in occlusion. Well, these can contact up near the incisal or down towards the cingulum. And I think you should take note of these contact areas on the teeth. Sometimes you will have nice ridges of the, on the teeth. Sometimes they will be rather significantly worn. If we were to look at uh, the incisal edge of this tooth, we can see two distinct colorations. The whitish area around the outside, which is your enamel, and the yellower area on the inside in the center, and this is our dentin. This tooth is actually worn to the point where it is braided right through the entire incisal enamel and is worn into the dentin. You notice this is a ribbon-shaped type of uh, wear pattern. It's rather long and equal in its width. We'll compare this with uh, some of the other teeth here later. Uh, some of the wear patterns uh, can become fairly significant on these. Uh, this central having a rather distinct wear pattern that extends way down onto the lingual of the tooth. You can see some of the dentin showing through in here, but uh, a rather extensive, heavy wear pattern that exists on some of these teeth. Fact is, we have seen in the mouth some of these teeth that are actually worn off right down to the uh, cervical line. In this instance, we've got three various colors on this tooth. One is where we've got our enamel on the outside, and we've got our central dentin area. Then we've actually got a darkened area in the middle, which is a secondary dentin, or a area where the pulp used to be, but has filled in with a reparative dentin. So we've got three variations on these. Now on your lower incisors, we expect to see wear also, but our wear will usually be at a different angle. And that is our wear will be towards the labial. It'll be worn off more in this angle. And this is dependent basically on the way that these teeth are occluding. If we take a couple of these that have worn rather significantly, and in the mouth, remember, we're, we're going to be occluding in this way, and the teeth will be sliding back and forth in this manner as you bite and chew. We're going to get our wear on the labial direction of our lowers, and on the maxillary teeth, we'll get it on the lingual. So we'll have a rather distinct difference in the direction of our wear patterns on these two teeth. If we, look, if we look to some of the other variations, you're going to find variations as far as the root form and the length and the curvature. Actually, you got a central incisor here that's got a rather sharp curve to it. These are just kind of freakish variations which are not you know, unusual, but we're not going to spend and dwell a lot of time uh, with in this particular series. You've got whole courses in pathology which will deal with the uh, various uh, uh, variations and 
diseases that occur within the teeth. Occasionally you'll find little notches that will occur down on the root surface of these teeth, such as long in here and long in here. And you may wonder what those are. When these teeth are removed, sometimes they come out rather difficult. And where the forcep has been placed and sometimes kind of ratched back and forth, or, uh, it'll actually notch these teeth mechanically right in the cementum portion of it. So sometimes we can actually see the damage remaining on the teeth and the uh, removal with the forceps. One of the variations that's common to these anterior teeth is what we call peg laterals. These are lateral incisors which are not shaped much like lateral. In fact, is a lateral incisor uh, occasionally is just plain missing in the mouth. And uh, when sometimes when it does develop and grow, it doesn't grow real characteristic or real strong. It has a tendency to be more cone-shaped. This is a real typical cone-shaped. These are dubbed peg laterals, and this becomes a common lay term, which uh, you may hear from uh, home and friends and what have you. Uh, this occurs occasionally with the uh, maxillary laterals. We're not, again, going to be holding you to these and expecting you to identify them and what have you, but it is something that you should be familiar with. Actually, one of the skulls we've been studying has a rather nice pair of these peg laterals, and they're just plain misshaped conical incisor teeth. Let's take a look at our individual incisors again, see if we can't review some of the terminology we've been studying, and at the same time we will attempt to identify the different incisors one from another. There are rather strong characteristics which we can use in identifying them. On our central, I think that's probably the easiest tooth in the mouth to identify, we've got some uh, different angles on here that are very important. Our mesial incisal angle being much sharper than our distal incisal angle. Now we're going to be asked to duplicate these teeth in the mouth. Not only are we going to be doing it in wax in the lab, but actually you do it in the mouth in uh, acrylics, and plastics, and synthetic porcelains. We do it in uh, regular porcelain, various waxes and golds and whatever. And if you get these incisal angles mixed up, it just makes it look like an entirely different tooth and just ruins the whole appearance. So a very minor thing like that can it actually becomes very major when we start uh, trying to restore these teeth. This identifies this mesial from distal, which is one of the important aspects of it. Another way of identifying mesial and distal, as we indicated to you, was by the height of the cervical lines. On the distal, it doesn't quite, quite so close to the incisal edge. On the mesial, this comes rather significantly closer to the incisal edge. We just got a higher cervical uh, line or closer to the incisal edge here on the mesial. We've also got uh, contact areas or height of contour. Generally height of contour would be the proper term since we really aren't touching anything. And the uh, height of contour is closest to the incisal edge at the mesial. And when it's contacting the smaller distal, it drops down closer to the cervical. This is a important characteristic here. We've also got our root, which becomes rather broad to the labial, and it's a triangular formed root, basically through the cervical third here, and it narrows as it comes to the lingual. And this is more of the apex of our triangle. If you think of this being the keystone in the arch, actually the front uh, stone in the arch, we've got a natural shaping of our uh, root structure here because it being broader to the labial and narrower to the lingual where the arch is smaller. If we look to our laterals, these are easy to separate from the maxillary centrals in so much as they are smaller in overall size, narrower from the mesial to the distal and often shorter from uh, incisal to cervical. We've got the same basic angles on the incisal edge or ridge, either term generally used there, but they're both of them are a little bit more rounded than the in the centrals, but we've still got a mesial incisal angle that's sharper than our distal incisal angle. We've got uh, heights of contours on the mesial and distal, which are again uh, a little higher or closer to the incisal on the mesial and it starts to get a little bit more cervically oriented towards the distal. Actually, both of them are closer to the cervical 
uh, in the lateral, this contacting a cuspid on the distal here. We've got the same basic structure to our cervical line, the mesial portion coming closer to the incisal edge than the distal. We've got a uh, characteristic to the root in so much as it's said to be conical, or I would like to call it oval or egg-shaped, I think is a better description on it, because it's a little broader, again, to the labial than it is the lingual, but it's certainly not triangular like our central. It doesn't get that much of a broadness. It's uh, much more rounded than what our central is. And I think this is an important characteristic to distinguish it between the mandibular incisors, which this one is sometimes confused with. We don't generally have any grooves in the root structure of this tooth, which is very common in the mandibulars. We do frequently have rather heavy marginal ridges on the lingual surface of these teeth, the heaviest of any of the incisors, and oftentimes a rather deep fit in the lingual uh, area, right at the apex of our lingual fossa, actually. Our wear pattern can be used at an angle to the lingual here on our maxillary teeth, and uh, that will sometimes help to distinguish them from your mandibular teeth. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.